So, welcome everyone here on site and of course also online. We are here for another great session of Connect at Advance. I hope you can all hear me online as well. Is the microphone working, Bruno? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Right, um, yes, another great session of Connect at Advance. And today's topic is a very relevant one. The tech world is in high demand of more female talent. Why? I think you all know that. Diversity, gender diversity, but diversity in general is, is a booster for innovation. It leads to higher productivity and in general, happier teams. But somehow the tech industry is a bit lagging in increase of women in diverse positions or yeah, diverse positions, that's a good term. So what is happening? Why is this the case? This is why we're here to actually discuss this together with experts from education, from companies to together find out what it takes to see more women succeed in the industry. So how can we bridge the gender gap in STEM? Um, <laughs> before I am introducing our wonderful moderator, I would like to thank our host Six for having us here today. This event takes place in cooperation not only with SIX, but also with Girls in Tech. Girls in Tech is a non-profit organization with the aim of seeing more women in the tech industry and bringing more diversity to the tech industry. I think it's a non-profit. We'll hear a bit more about Girls in Tech later. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you. My name is Alexandra Riener. I am the comms, I lead the comms team at Advance. And uh, I think it's wonderful to see you all here. Why? Because you're the lucky few, the lucky view, few people who came here today when everybody else is going on a long weekend. <laughs> so congratulations. Also you online, congrats for spending this, these two hours with us. Uh, we will have an apero afterwards, we'll, which will be a great send off to the long weekend. And I'm sure you will enjoy it even more after having been enriched with great insights and uh, lots of motivation to succeed in STEM. Okay, now before introducing Lisa, our wonderful moderator, as I said before, let me take this opportunity just to just very briefly uh, present to you who Advance is and what we do. Um, but first of all, who is here um, at the first Advance event? Oh no, let me ask the other way around. Who has been at an Advance event workshop, training, round table, or any other thing that we do. Please hands up. Oh, wow. <laughs> this looks quite good. Quite good. And still a couple of people who would like to know a little bit more about Advance. Right. Advance is a company network of 134 members. This number makes us really proud and not us as management team. It makes us as a community very proud. So we have grown from 10 members to 134 in only, not even 10 years. So we think this is a success. And of course, this is one of our favorite slides. Um, what do we do? Advance offers the member companies a concrete program. And that program is based on four pillars. So we are not just coming together to network, excuse me, to network and drink Prosecco and exchange, we also really offer concrete uh, trainings. That's the skill building workshop pillar, where it's all about, excuse me, all about uh, equipping women, female talent with leadership score, core skills. So, excuse me. So this is what uh, this pillar is about, and it's mostly focused on women. Then we do a cross company mentoring program, which targets um, senior female um, <clears throat> talent who will be matched with a senior executive from another company. And they spend a year together, and this has proved extremely powerful for making the step up into the top executive ranks. Then Connected Advance, you're here for this. I'm not spending any more words. And the Future Workplace is a format where we bring DNI people together to exchange on best practices and to learn from each other. 
So this is highly appreciated by HR people and DNI experts. Right, so, so much for advance, let's move on. Lisa Staley is one of our stars today on stage. Let me quickly read her intro because it's one of the most beautiful ones I've ever um, read about a person, really. <laughs> it's so lively and it brings your story really to life. And let me catch a breath. Lisa Steli is co-managing director of Girls in Tech. This is a non-profit organization. I pointed it out before. Um, yeah, with the aim I said before. So Lisa, that's her own story. Now, really interesting. She grew up in a non-technical, non-academic environment, and she had to literally argue and fight with teachers and parents alike to go to high school and to study at ETH Zurich. Against all odds, as she says, she graduated in 2018 from ETH Zurich with a master's degree in geometrics engineering. And I hope she will explain us later what that is. Today, she works as a senior product engineer at ESRI and her biggest dream, and let's dream that together, please. Her biggest dream is that one day, young women will be able to confidently choose to study a technical subject and receive the support they need from their family, from their schools, from universities, from companies, and from societies at large. I love that dream, Lisa, really. <laughs> so with this, I would like to welcome you on stage and I can hand over to you. You will introduce our panel guests and we have plenty of them here. So please, Lisa, come on stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Microphone working. Thank you so much. Yes. All right, Alexandra, thank you so much for this nice introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, both as uh, co managing director of Girls in Tech Switzerland, which uh, was correctly noticed, is a non profit organization where a team of about 20 volunteers, both in Zurich and Geneva, we're organizing together with partners events like the one that we have today. And so this dream that Alexander was mentioning, um, I think I'm hoping today we can get a little bit closer to that um, with this panel. So this idea of uh, bringing together people from various different um, pr perspectives on this topic of STEM education and how what we can do in this um, uh, area was actually an idea I had about a year ago. And I started talking with people about it, including Sara and Marina as well, at another panel. And now I'm so happy that we can finally be here today and, and actually talk about um, this topic. And I also want to welcome all of you here today. We're going to first have a panel discussion, but then afterwards we'll have a Q&A. And I really ask you to write down questions for the panelists, for the audience as well. So this is an open conversation. Um, I'm seeing this not as just like a presentation that we seven of us have here in front, but it's really an exchange. So let's make this back and forth and you can feel free to write down questions already um, around six o'clock. I'll then open it up for the Q&A. All right, so that's um, for now, I want to quickly introduce you to these wonderful people here up on stage. Um, some of you I know personally, some of you have just met today. Um, and I don't want to say too much because we have so many panelists, <laughs> so we don't, we don't waste too much time here. We can actually start with a discussion. So I'd like to start with uh, Patricia, Dr. Patricia, Patricia Ritme here um, to my to my right. Um, Patricia is a Vice Director of Open Enrollment and Diversity at the University of St. Gallen. Um, and she studied business administration at the University of Zurich. So that's her educational um, background. Thanks for clicking the slides. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> then we have Dr. Alain Gut with us, um, the, the man in the round. Very happy to have you here. I think this is really a topic we should open up um, and not discuss just amongst us women, <laughs> right? Um, so Alain is a chairman of the Education and St Skilled Workforce Committee of Digital Switzerland. This is the role that he's here today, but he also works as a director of public affairs at IBM Switzerland. And he has a background in business informatics from the University of Zurich. 
And then next to him is Dr. Darcy Molnar, who joins us today from uh, ETH Zurich, and she's a program coordinator at the Institute of Environmental Engineering at ETH Zurich. And she studied physics, civil engineering um, in the US at the Colorado State University. And then we have Sara Kaiser, who um, came here all the way from Luxembourg to join this panel. So very happy to have you here. And she's the program director of the Luxembourg Tech School. Um, she studied management and tourism at Academia Engiadina, which I didn't actually know that existed. Yeah, the highest <laughs> school of tourism, actually. <laughs> yeah, sorry, cool. All right. Um, and then next to Sara, we have Dr. Marina de Quieros Tavares. I hope I pronounced this correctly, more or less. And uh, Marina is... Uh, a lecturer at the Institute of Signal Processing and Wireless Communications at Setave School of Engineering, and she studied microelectronics and electrotechnics at uh, um, INSA in Lyon. And then, last but not least, we have Julia here from SIX. Julia, is, uh, Julia Meldere is the head of Public Cloud Competence Center at SIX, and she studied strategic marketing at the University of Greenwich. So, just to have a bit of an overview of the panels. And now I'm going to sit down as well, and I can totally relate to getting out of breath when speaking publicly. So I'd like to um, open our panel discussion with a very simple question for all of you. Um, we don't all have to answer, but of course, when we talk about education or the role of education, it's interesting to hear from the panelists what their background is uh, from an educational perspective and how they um, found their way into tech. So I'm going to um, start maybe with Patricia and uh, what you, your background is in education and how you found your way. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa, for, for the opening question. Um, obviously, when we prepared for the panel, you, you sent us this question and I was really thinking, I'm like, wow, if you had asked me this question like 30 years ago, um, when I kind of uh, um, started my university career, I would have never thought that I would talk about bridging the gender gap in STEM. First of all, gender was not a topic back then. I would thought, well, I'm going to study. My, the world is open. I can do anything. There's no bar there are no barriers. Second, I was not in STEM at all. I studied business administration. I started in a bank. There were barely emails, no client relationship management systems, nothing. Um, my husband is a huge tech enthusiast. I'm totally stereotypical. But then I um, we moved to the US and there innovation and tech is everywhere. Um, I came back, started at the University of St. Gallen um, and then educational technological, uh, te technical disruption is a daily business nowadays. And I don't even know how this happened. It just went so fast. And still sometimes I'm like, Am I really talking about tech now? Like, uh, for instance, um, in terms of uh, digital education and e-learning journeys and stuff like that. It's just um, uh, something that is uh, happening and has been happening from the past few years. But honestly, I never thought that uh, I would be in a panel talking about STEM and tech. So it's uh, just uh, one of those journeys where I'm like, hey, everything can happen. So just uh, try it out. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. Um, we're also going to probably talk a little bit about the differences in countries and then also, of course, how today basically every company is a tech company in a way, right? So I think you touched on both of these topics a little bit so we can continue that. All right. Anyone else would like to share their educational journey? Maybe I can. Yes, mm -hmm. please. <laughs> So, but I have a similar experience as Patricia because my education was initially completely unrelated to technology. So I studied uh, communications and sociology as my first degree and then strategic marketing as my master's degree. And then one day I got a call by looking for a job after my graduation from a technology consultancy offering me a job in a very technical area of data center migration saying that my profile matches perfectly. <laughs> I was a bit surprised at the time asking like, have you actually checked my profile carefully about <laughs> what you see there? And then the feedback was that, uh, you know what, uh, no one is born expert in data center migration. So no one is dreaming about it. Like, you know, I will be a fireman or I will be in technology. <laughs> but what we care about is about understanding what are the customer needs and uh, really getting to the point about what are the requirements? What actually, how can we help and add value? and then translate it into the solution. So that's, and pretty much this skill is universal and applicable to any industry. And that's kind of, you know, for me, it sounded very reasonable at that time. And that's how my 
technology journey started. Very nice. This actually is a perfect bridge to my next question. So we're going to move into the skills. And um, I think you phrased it very, very beautifully, right? It's not, I also didn't dream as a kid to become a geomatics engineer. By the way, this is a surveying degree. So you learn how to measure things very accurately. So that's what I studied. Uh, I also definitely didn't didn't dream of that. But I think the skills that I, that we learn at universities, um, they're, they're very applicable. So my next question is um, also based of your experience uh, working in the tech field or working as an educator, what do you think are the most important skills today um, that someone needs to succeed and thrive in a technical career? Maybe I, maybe I, I can start. Um, I think this is a question that I'm often being asked. And if I'm looking back, why I have studied informatics, I would say because technology was always has always interested me also during high school. And I really feel at home here because I have three daughters. <laughs> one studied tourism, the second one marketing, the third one social worker. So I really didn't succeed. <laughs> so, and I always ask why? Because all of them in school have been better in math than in, the, in languages. And I never, I had no clue why. And so after, after some years, and I always thought about and asked my wife, what, what did I wrong? And then suddenly it came to my mind. I looked at the girlfriends of my daughters. I looked at their peer group and no one studied something technical. And I think peer group is really important. And from a skill point of view, um, at the end, mathematics is important. And um, there, there is a huge study of the Canton of Zurich. They are doing a research for many years now. What are students doing after the school is finished? What, what, in what direction, in what profession they are going? And in technical profession, only students who are good in math and good in German. They are in going into that because it's quite an analytic analytic um, as well the, the language itself. So I think at the end, math is important. We have a lot of discussions uh, how mathematics should be teached at school. I think this is one of the main issues. And at the end, I think from an important skills point of view, then of course it's everything what to do has with communication, social skills is so important that and the whole tech has such a completely wrong image. Um, that it's only programming and it's uh, not a social profession. So I think at the end, uh, if we can convince, I think we will talk about that, many stakeholders, um, that it's really a, quite a communicative and social profession, then I think we can succeed. Yeah, Marina. I, I would like to give a little yeah. bit of a less conventional answer, if I may. <laughs> I also have actually very similar experiences you have and, and this it's just I would like to be a little bit provocative because I think that actually the decisive skills are two and I think it's self-confidence and sense of liberty of choice and self-confidence will actually allow the girls to continue to say I like math because the problem is that not that they are not good but it gets to be uncool to be good in math from exactly. 11 years onwards. So I actually would say, put your daughter to play football mm -hmm. and if possible in a mixed team so that she really feels confident about herself. She feels confident about being there and then she will also be confident about saying, I like math and I continue to like it and I have no problem with it. So actually, my advice would be let them play football in a mix of <laughs> games. <laughs> and the second one is really about the sense of liberty of choice. And this is quite important because uh, it's not easy. There is societal pressure. There is uh, pressure from, from school, from peers, groups and all, and, and all of this. And that means the kid has to have a sense of uh, my choices are respected. And these choices uh, they are not always going to be about profession, they are going to be about other things. At home at the moment we, we fight about how many hours they have of screen or how many francs they get per week. But I mean, from my point of view, kids need really 
self-confidence and the sense of they have liberty of choices. Mm -hmm. And if I can add something, I'm, I totally agree. And, and what I see is like this kind of exposure that, that you give them. It's not so much, I mean, I work with like 12 to 19 years old in, in Luxembourg and, and um, like opening up their view about technology and about what is possible and, and, and like giving them this exposure to like different, different technical topics. And as you said, it's not only about like technical. So going from another angle and bring in like the whole storytelling, creative side, the whole like um, communication side that you can do with technology and with the whole like practical work you can do that opens up really like the, the world for the for the girls. And then they if they have someone around them, I totally agree. They, they want to come with um, with other girls to the um, to the classes um, and, and then this is like you wake up the curiosity of them and you, mm -hmm. you show them like everything is possible also in, in this kind of subjects and then like slowly by slowly they they mm -hmm. lose the fear of of of, um, of of that like barrier that might be that might exist in the beginning. Maybe I'll add um, you know I we had the questions beforehand, so just some points that I wrote down were math and logical, you know, kind of those thinking skills, um, problem solving, especially for engineering. But mm -hmm. I think to to even young kids can be encouraged to do problem solving activities, and uh, the curiosity about the world, about how things work. I think we can we can you know inspire that in the young children. I agree with all that's been said here, and I'm just mm -hmm. kind of trying to complement from my own experience. Um, I would add, I have two daughters and I guess I was successful. <laughs> no, because I, it's really nature plus nurture, right? And so um, my oldest daughter, she was, you know, for the guinea, they have to choose which profile, right? So she was deciding uh, languages or, or maths and, and sciences. Languages, maths and sciences. She couldn't decide. And I said, you know, if you can do the math, I know you can go for it. Yeah, but all my friends are doing the languages, right? So until the very last moment, you know, I signed her paper. She took it to school without having decided. Until the last <laughs> moment, she she clicked maths. And and then she was so happy that, you know, later she was so happy. And now she's doing a, a master's in physics. But it was that one moment. And if I hadn't been, you know, encouraging her, she can do it. If I hadn't been there, I think she wouldn't have. And she would have gone in another direction and maybe made it back to technology. But um, I just saw in that moment how really important the support and, um, you know, giving them confidence. Mm -hmm. They can do it. They can yeah. do it. She can do it. She's doing a master's now. And mm -hmm. my second daughter was always very much um, interested in how things work. So she would have puzzles. I would always give her puzzles. She loved puzzles. So her whole room was full of puzzles, always making puzzles. And and now she ended up by herself finding this um, Alere as constructorin at ETH in, in the physics uh, department. So she's designing on the computer, which, you know, there are, there are not very many men who do that. Um, so she's quite a minority there. But, but again, you know, I think um, it's really this combination of, of giving them the confidence, let them do what they want to do, go to whatever ferien course they want to go to, even if they're the only girl. Just let them go and give them the confidence they can do it. Why not? You know, and yeah. So that's kind of my take on things. Can I add on, on one? Because um, uh, when I thought about the skills and um, you said self confidence and liberty of choice, and I would like to add a third one because I'm totally with you, but I feel resilience is super important because if they're self confident, I, I have a daughter and a son. So, um, they're self-confident. We give them, you know, this uh, um, on their way. They have the liberty of choice. Sometimes it's even overwhelming to have such a liberty, right? Um, so they're already, they need some sort of resilience. And then if they really live their dream and if they are self-confident in, in front of their peers and in front of their teachers, they sometimes also feel um, a backlash, you know, because it mm -hmm. does not confirm with the stereotype. Mm -hmm. And there I feel it's also our responsibility as parents, as well as educators, to, to actually help them to become resilient and to stand their ground. So my daughter um, faced that a lot um, in high school. Um, there, there were some tears, there were some uh, um, discussions. She eventually did not go into math. She even went as far as she 
crossed mass, went there, handed it in. Three months later, she came and said, I have to change. Because, you know, I don't think um, I can do that. I will not be strong enough to pull through because um, everybody says it's just for boys. Mm -hmm. So she even had a friend who was the best in class in math. It broke my heart. And she actually wanted to go into math. And um, her parents told her, you shouldn't do that. It's something for boys. You will be much better off with languages. I was so close to go to the door of the parent <laughs> and tell them. Um, my daughter was, you're not going to do that. That's so embarrassing. <laughs> but I mean, you know, those are the things which are very important. So that I just wanted to add that that um, image of resilience because I think um, it will be actually also nurtured with self confidence. Mm -hmm. I have one list. One, <laughs> one, all right. On the I'm one, sorry. then we'll move on to the next question. Yeah. No, but just uh, in the interest because. Uh, if if we are um, if you look around our daily lives, I mean our daily lives now are completely emerged into tech products, but actually we are pushed into a role of consumers most of the time, and I think what we need to give but not only girls, all kids, is a, also a sense like of what is behind the scene, and if we have a little bit the chance of to be an actor and not only a consumer. With respect to the stack word, I think this brings a red the curiosity kind of naturally because mm -hmm. kids are naturally curious. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love everything that you guys shared also from your kids. That's it's very nice uh, to see. There's also lots of parents here doing a great job, I'm sure, uh, all of you. Yeah, I think back to my story continued. Very nice. But I think what we've seen is that uh, actually the skills and interests needed to succeed in tech, it doesn't matter whether, whether that's a girl or a boy, but often girls, they're facing a bit more backlash. And, and I've experienced this myself. Um, and I was exactly that decisive moment when I choose physics and math in high school. Uh, it was my worst subject. I was I was pretty good at all the other subjects that had like a decent grade. And I was like, I want to learn more here, so I'm going to do that. But I know that's not all the kids are going to be like that, right? I think that's um, that's very, it was very nice uh, hearing all of your um, uh, stories here. Um, let's move on to the landscape um, because I, having all these experts here is actually super interesting. So I've given them a little task mm -hmm. to look for some facts because I like to understand the current state of STEM education um, in terms of the gender gap, because we always talk about this gender gap. And I'm wondering, um, so what are, what's in your institution or uh, in your organization, what are the actual numbers that we're talking about here today? So whoever wants to start, I know some of you have cheat sheets with numbers on it. So <laughs> feel free to, to get started um, and tell us a little bit about uh, what are we actually dealing with That's regarding numbers. I have one number. Only yes, please. One number, only please. one number. Number of women studying informatics at a university or vocational training. Today, around 12%. And what really worrying me is it's the same figure since 20 years. The last 20 years, it was always between 11 and 12 percent. I'll, compl I'll complement that then. So um, for ETH for 2020, on average, it's 32 percent. But if you look at um, like mechanical and process engineering is the lowest, it's 13 percent. And I think informatics is around there as well. So the really pure engineering, computer science, informatics, mechanical engineering, it's more, you know, 12 to 15 percent. Mass and physics is around 20 percent, which is interesting because that's a bit when um, there was a study also of, of um, graduates from gymnasium and about 23 uh, percent are girls in the math profile. So it's kind of, you know, so for me, I see the challenges at gymnasium or younger ages, right? Because if we only have 23 percent are doing the math profile and those tend to go to engineering, we can't get more at ETH, right? So, mm -hmm. so this is this is, I think, where where the biggest challenge is. Um, but like you commented, that, that it's increased by maybe three percent since 2006, three or five percent. But what's really encouraging to me is there's health sciences and technology at ETH that is 63 percent women. So you know, you take these health mm -hmm. and medicine kind of pharmaceutical directions, and I think there are a lot more women in those areas. 
Also environmental sciences is, is over 50%. I'm in environmental engineering and that's about 50%. So certain topics, you know, why and what topics, I think you get pure engineering, it's much lower, but as you get to environmental health, then then we're, we're right up there. And so that to me is an encouraging fact. Yeah, but, but I assume the, the figure would be even worse if you would differentiate between Swiss students and foreign students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Swiss was slight. I have the numbers here. I can show you later. <laughs> Swiss, I got all the numbers ready. <laughs> yeah. Um, the yeah, the Swiss are slightly lower. Of course, the bachelor degree. Uh, you know, I was looking mainly at bachelor degree, and that's mainly Swiss students, right? But at the master level, okay. then you have more um, female international students coming in, and the numbers are a bit higher there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at ETH with us, I know it's, it's this leaking pipeline of you have quite a, a lot of bachelor, the percentage is higher, and you go to master's, and then it goes down, PhD, and then professors, it's, it's extremely low, right? That's it's like, how, how do we lose women along the pipeline, right? It's also a big one. Yeah, Marina. Uh, so for, for my institution, I mean, I come from the School of Engineering, the ZHV, we are also low, like you guys. <laughs> uh, the progression, there is one, and I I, I, I need to to see it because I, I'm the diversity person in the in the School of Engineering. So I, I, was, like, I was really like scared about do we have so many? And it's it's terrible. It's like 0.5% better every year since I started the function. But I mean it's it's horribly slow. So we are about the 10 to 11 percent now uh, combined and we have like eight hardcore engineering basically. So it's not very easy. But the number which really got me scared and it's the number that I would like to to bring to complement what you guys said is that I was looking at uh, what happens because we are a university of applied science. So we, with Switzerland, with this dual ladder, uh, we come from over the mostly from apprenticeships. I mean, we do have a little bit of people that comes from Gimi, but it's minority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking yeah. like, OK, so our really problem is that we don't have enough girls going to technical apprenticeships and our engineering courses, you can only get there if you have done one of this. And then I went to look at it. How was it last year? So how many girls enrolled in informatics? Because, I mean, it's kind of the biggest uh, field at the moment for uh, apprenticeships. And, and the number was so scary that I don't know if I tell you this one. <laughs> <laughs> so from all the girls that had to choose an apprenticeship last year, 0.8% chose to go into informatics. 3.3 choose to something related to engineering and 3.5 something related to architecture and building. So that is, I think, the most scary number is that we are missing actually really what happens around 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And that is the big break point right now. Exactly. And we don't get that one. We are not going to get it. Mm -hmm. But there are very, very interesting points to do it right now because like the uh, like, or no, call for actions later. <laughs> <laughs> that makes some suspense. Maybe we'll stay with the 15 year olds yes, because I'm yes. sure Sarah can, yeah. can share from her experience. Yeah. Yeah. I have like 12 to 19 years old, so like the whole gymnasium um, age. And, and, and yes, we have at the moment nearly 40% girls. So, um, which is quite good, not where I want to be, um, but um, I also see that pattern, the younger they are, and also the more international the school and the environment is, the higher the number. So that means we lose them over time, usually. And also if there is like a um, only Luxembourgish um, environment or a Luxembourgish school, um, the numbers are lower. So so as uh, I, that's one pattern, it always like, Sometimes I cannot even explain why, because from year to year changes, I have all of a sudden this year in my most advanced group at 19 years old, I have more girls than, than boys, which is nice, but it can be totally different next year. So, so you cannot like say it's a tendency, but I see more girls and more parents also like registering their girls, um, more girls coming in groups with friends. So, so that's, starts a little bit but then I also did some uh, some homework and looked into the statistics and in Luxembourg actually we are like the, the uh, have the least number of female engineers and scientists in whole Europe so we have we are like 28 percent 
So which then, okay, it's 2019. I always have like um, the hope that it's slowly changing and, and, and I see that many girls are there. We have girls from, from Luxembourg Tech School now at ETH and studying things. So yes, it's like it's coming, but slowly and, and like really small numbers still, yeah. I mean, obviously the University of St. Gallen is a business school um, known for business uh, administration and economics, international relations. We do have a school of medicine and a school of computer science, but it's always related to the business. But even though we are not a pure STEM school, the numbers are a bit um, scary because um, and we can probably talk about the, the reasons why these <laughs> numbers are there, uh, because they're exactly the same uh, in St. Gallen. Um, we are not uh, an equal um, uh, 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 at equality there. We have around one third of uh, women starting with us. Um, we're going to lose them, as you just mentioned, you know, to the master and so on. And then what is really frightening, because I work in executive education, there the numbers are super low. I mean, if you look at the executive MBA, um, they're really struggling. If you look at um, certain, for instance, I don't know, business seminars like people analytics, which is always related to business, you have maybe two women in a course of 20, 30 people, you know, mm -hmm. like it's it, it's very um, interesting to see that, especially in executive education, it's, as soon as it's related to um, a little bit of uh, tech, um, there the numbers are dropping drastically. And I think in general, executive education is an issue because women um, ask far less for further development um, due to many reasons. Um, and I think we do have a lot of homework in front of us. So um, mm -hmm. it doesn't really necessarily have to do with STEM, but we will talk about the reasons later and they're quite uh, common. Mm -hmm. We'll go into this uh, just in a second. Uh, I think that's also a very valuable point and, and an important discussion to have also for companies, right? What com companies actually do mm -hmm. to encourage women. But let's quickly stay with with um, with the educational organizations and because uh, Marina already touched on this. Um, so we're all facing this problem that there's not enough um, girls, young women that want to study technical degrees. Um, what are things that you do at universities, at, um, at schools to help um, girls to make a decision in that direction? What are things that you feel like are actually working and, and what are um, more like initiatives that maybe are not so useful um, for the girls? I can mention mm -hmm. one I'm involved in. Um, and so like someone stated here, it seems that girls and do just as well as boys through primary. I mean, we, so I'm working with someone who's responsible for the kangaroo competition. Maybe you know this, this math competition, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I know the boss of that, right? <laughs> but she's, so they've noticed, you know, they keep track of these data and they see that the girls do just as well as boys throughout primary school, but later in high school, they don't do as, as well, or they aren't participating as much maybe because of the competition. Um, and so together with this uh, Mike from math department, we've organized this, it's called Kangaroo Go Science. It's an event where we take the top 100 girls um, from this math competition, the 12 year olds, before they decide their profile at the, the gymnasium or so. Um, we, we bring the top 100 girls from this competition that took place in March. We bring them to Eteha for one day and we kind of like we, we celebrate their success that they were one of the top 100 and we show them labs and we show them Eteha and we just try to inspire them about STEM. And we also invite their parents. And it was really interesting the first year we did this, some, one of the parents said, we had no idea our daughter was good at maths and others were farmers. And they said, we never thought that our daughter could maybe go to Eteha. So I think the role of parents and engaging them in these activities is, is very important. And so this is like just one event once a year. It would be nice to see these kinds of things happening more because I think it's just, you know, one day, but um, the girls feel like, wow, I can do this. And, and they're with other girls also, and um, we support them. So, so this is something that's, you know, but we've done on the side. It's not an Eteha activity. It's two of us who said, okay, we want to do this. We feel this is important. We've done two it women. now since 2018. <laughs> it's in June coming up, Kangaroo Go Science ETH. You can look it up and see videos there. And so, um, but there are also, um, I know the mechanical engineering department has activities, mint and pepper, you know, different activities for schools to support schools in bringing mint, uh, STEM, topics into schools. So if you search, there is a lot going on, but I think the challenge is that the, 
we need the teachers from the secondary schools, we need the teachers to say, yes, I would like to bring this into my classroom. Yes, it would be cool to do this with my kids. And I think that maybe is missing a little bit. So there are a lot of offers out there. Um, also, you know, camps for girls in tech and computer science and, you know, all kinds of things. But the parents don't know about it. The teachers don't know about it. Um, so I think this is a bit the challenge on, on, on connecting because a lot is going on. But the connection between parents and teachers is perhaps not there. So it's kind of like you, you, you are talking about the mission that we have in Luxembourg Tech School, like doing that pitch. We actually try. We are professionals. Um, from technical backgrounds or with technical backgrounds and going to the to the high schools to the gymnasium and and trying to have that bridge like showing what is out there um, um, coming from these companies organizations and and really uh, not only show the girls and, and, and the boys that are there but actually yes as you say it's very important to take with you the siblings the families the parents the the whole environment and even like to the participants, we always say like, bring your friends with you to events. And so they can also see, they can also like, maybe they don't want to enroll for a whole program because yeah, it's still coding and it's still like tech. But if you see one event and you see, okay, it's so much um, about design, about artistic things, about storytelling. So, okay, yeah, maybe I, I, go, I go to another event or, or maybe one day I enroll. So and making um, it more approachable, right? To yes, people who are trying to have and that thing. bridge. I think it's mm -hmm. really essential and we're working very hard to to have that because the professional side is very much like wishing for that bridge. Mm -hmm. And and I also see the schools wishing for that, but they have so many other things to do. And, and it's like there's so much like on the pressure from with their own um, curriculum and everything. So so we it's not been, really a, been made a priority also. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. So it needs, I believe it needs organizations and, and people like trying to connect that and, and match those offers with the students and with the teachers. Yeah. I would like to hook up to the <laughs> two points that came there and bring a, a key word, which is multipliers or natural multipliers. Because I'm really convinced that our natural multipliers for all these initiatives, which are there, and we also do a bunch of them, <laughs> are the school teachers. So because in the School of Engineering, we have like a big calendar of stuff that we do. I mean, we offer quite some different events, but our capacity is limited and we don't have any pedagogical school associated to us. I think at the age also doesn't have one directly in, in, in Zurich. We have the PHAZ at HAW or close to Winterthur. We have also the PH Thurgau and so on. But let's say we are not people which are daily forming these teachers. So how, what it, can we do? Actually, I think we have to work much closer to these school teachers. And uh, since 2018, we are doing this in, in Winterthur together with the education department and really offering like a regular calendar of, of stuff for teachers. And uh, it's kind of a big learn curve because I mean, once you think like, yes, now, now it's really cool. And so, and then they look at you and said, no, I don't have the time to do this. And it's mm -hmm. okay. Why you don't have the time? Oh, because uh, the material is not there because it doesn't come really related to the curriculum that we have to do. Okay. We reformulate. So, I mean, I have to tell you the truth. We've been them reformulating these things for the last two, three years, but we are getting there. Now we really have like uh, boxes which the teachers can rent uh, for free at the, the education department. We continue to show off the courses that go match with this. The uh, handouts are uploaded. They are being reviewed by teachers. We are doing an association with uh, PEHAS to review this. So, I mean, I'm kind of convinced that you have to do this. But in a way, it's also it depends on the openness that you have because a, a much uh, steep learning curve I had, for instance, in an initiative that we have in Brazil because, OK, I'm Brazilian, so I go to Brazil regularly and I, I kind of had a bad feeling about, come on, we are doing so much in Switzerland, why you don't do something there and then get a chance to collaborate there. <clears throat> and it was quite impressive, like one uh, school director of a large school, they have 600 little kids like pumping all around. She said, I give you one year if you're able to take all the meetings that I have regularly with my whole uh, uh, body of teachers. So we had the 25 teachers in front of us. I give you uh, two hours per week, our normal meeting, and you form these teachers to give robotic courses to the to the mm -hmm. children. 
And I got some crazy three colleagues which got on board with me on this one. <laughs> and we are doing great. <laughs> I mean, it, it got so well that now we are trying to amplify to five more schools and we are looking for money, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, it, 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 and it's quite impressive because actually just depending on this school director, yeah, this lady like looked at us and said, yeah. go for it. I give mm. you this two hours a week and mm. you put some material in the hand. And now we have 600 kids doing it. And we didn't force the content. Mm -hmm. We asked them, what do you want us to do? Mm. And they told us, oh, we have a uh, gemüse garden, vegetable, vegetable garden, vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. we have like bees, uh, and we have uh, uh, com composting with worms with the kids. Mm -hmm. And like first my, my, my colleagues, they were all like electrical engineers like myself. They were looking at me and like, Marina, you're crazy. And I said, no, no worry, don't worry. It's like, so what is important for the worms? The temperature, great, our job. So what is important for the bees? The the uh, lärm peg, the how much noise there's around. And said, so, our job. I mean, <laughs> just tell us. And then we just turned out our course to be technical alphabetization. Mm -hmm. And we solved the problems, solved the problems. I mean, we do little devices and so, but mm -hmm. it's about this looking behind the scenes, yeah. which whatever context the school wants from us which whatever fits their mm -hmm. wishes and environment. Mm -hmm. And you can do it, come on. Yeah. It's no way. And, and so I would say we get a goal for this close work with natural multipliers. Mm -hmm. Anna, I'm sure you want to say yeah. something about this. Um, <laughs> you have asked what, what should the educators do? And if I would be an educator, I would completely change my curricula. I would completely change them. Um, because we know that the girls, the women, they have a little bit another interest than, than the men. Less interest maybe in only the technical things, but what you can do with it. And you can, you can see it with the different studies. There are more women in bioinformatics, there are more women in medicine informatics, which is much more complicated than any other informatics. But the women want to see the, the sense of, of it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I would completely change the curriculum. I would, I would make it, I would name it differently. Mm -hmm. I would, uh, I would make it more interdisciplinary. So I would really change it. And mm -hmm. then I, I, I'm sure it would be much more attractive for, for mm -hmm. girls or, mm -hmm. or women. Yeah, totally agree. Very nice um, hearing. I'm sure there might be questions afterwards also about this topic, but let's move on quickly to the um, what companies can do, what uh, Patrizia, you were mentioning on the further education of women, right? And and Julia, I'm sure you also have some experience there um, being part of a tech company or a company that has technical people. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm wondering um, how companies can provide opportunities for women to uh, improve and expand their technical skill set beyond the uh, university degree, right? When they're uh, then actually having uh, a career. Sure, thank you. So from where to start? So I think overall in the large organizations, uh, diversity and attracting more women to tech is a big topic. And it's really kind of, you know, pleasing to see how many informal organizations or groups are formed in different organizations or so sometimes it's mandated top down sometimes it's kind of a group of interest that is growing something larger but it definitely existed in all large organizations where i've been working with, and including six of course and i think it's also different levels of that it's kind of a starting with uh, trying to attract apprentices and again like you know coming to the point about how do we ensure that we when we have apprentices and this position that we have providing uh, right opportunities for boys and for girls. Uh, it's all about making job offerings more appealing for women because it's also coming back to the confidence. And it's I think it's a well known fact that if man sees the job position and half of the skills matching, he will apply. And unless a woman sees that 100% is matching, it's probably not the right time, not the right role and not the right opportunity. So it's just a natural thing. And I think it's a very strong and very powerful um, initiative. It's also to provide this coaching and working closer together with a um, you know, talent acquisitor about what line managers, what team members, what team leads can do to make uh, positions, to make a job offerings more attractive for women so that they are encouraged to apply. So that they are also not only kind of, you know, it's on, not only there, but it's also uh, kind of maybe they 
reach proactively to women, to girls, about kind of encouraging them to apply, encouraging them to consider. And I've seen it working quite a lot. But actually, uh, and I'm thinking about, uh, I was thinking about other initiatives of having like a hackathons for women and having like uh, some training, informal ones for women, like, you know, like on a regular basis. I've seen it all and it was all great. But something struck me today, actually, even kind of already when the session started. And what we were talking, it was how do we empower girls in the early age to proceed with tech and how to build this confidence. But probably something really big and important needs to be done with the changing in mindset of boys and men as well. Because this is a diversity event today. And if you look around, we can see who is mainly interested in this, right? And if you know how, how many, what the proportion of men who is interested, it's quite kind of, again, like, you know, I don't see how what is happening online, but like looking at the room, it's probably still most of the women are interested in it. And it's also not about how to increasing awareness or how to ensuring that girls are interested, empowered, and uh, kind of you know, willing and feeling comfortable, but also how we change the mindset of men, of boys, of team members, of managers to accommodate it. So how do we make men interested in this topic as well? Because that mm -hmm. might be another kind of multiplicator, I like the word a lot, that will help us to kind of, you know, to have a much more increase than 0.5% a year or even more than that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what, what uh, companies should go for is they should look for job changes, so-called Quereinsteiger, because this is a huge potential. We did, we did a study uh, just recently together with the Canton of Zurich, but the Swiss-wide figures. And there are, within the ICT professions, two-thirds of the people are so-called Quereinsteiger. And most part of the two-thirds are women. So I think this is, there is really a huge potential. This means for companies recruit differently and train them. And then you will get more women. Yeah, it's when you see job descriptions that says bachelor and master's degree in engineering, right? Mm -hmm. That's already excluding anyone who did a mm -hmm. Quereinsteig as a job changer. I think that's a very, very important part. Patricia, yeah. you have experience also with the MBAs, right? Yeah, and especially with uh, with the skills. You know, we talk a lot about transferable skills. And what we see a lot in the companies, they still focus largely on the number of years of experience. And so with the Querensteiger, that's not relevant. At the end of the day, you really have to be sure which skill set and mindset exactly. do you need in a role. Not if that person had like 10 years of experience. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's even um, a barrier if there's so many years of experience because you're not fresh anymore and you don't bring in a new perspective. Especially when I, I mean, I talk a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of times with large corporations and they're like, okay, we're a bank and we need somebody in marketing. So we need somebody who worked in a bank for the last 10 years in marketing. And I'm like, you're crazy. You're going to do more of the same, you know, where's the disruption and where is like the, the new perspectives. But I would like to also go back to what um, was said before with regards to um, the self-awareness of women, you know, when it comes to applying for jobs. Um, we see that actually also in the very, very early um, ages in school because they um, um, kind of perceive what their female teachers are um, giving them in terms of uh, self-assessment, in terms of math. We, we call that sometimes math anxiety because a lot of the female teachers in early ages and a lot of the teachers in primary school are females. That's another mm -hmm. topic actually to talk about. And a lot of them um, pass on their unconscious self-assessment towards STEM to the girls, you know. Mm -hmm. So you would even think that maybe um, male teachers might have a bigger impact there. Um, that's one point. And the other one is uh, what can core companies, but also we as executive educators uh, can do. We work a lot with role models because what you see, you believe. So if we only see uh, men in STEM, in, in leadership roles in STEM, how should we convince girls to do that? You know, they don't 
relate. So there was even a study uh, being done that said if girls had the same amount of role models um, in, in innovators, like female innovators, as girls, as boys, no, if girls have the same amount of um, female innovators as boys have with male innovators, you could cut the gender gap in half. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to work more with, uh, with role models early on in schools, but then also um, in high school and uh, early careers and so on. And I'm also a big fan of, uh, of the mentoring program, not only from advance, but in general mentoring. And there I also feel uh, we really have to look very closely who is mentoring whom, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't say that a man cannot mentor a, a woman. That's not what I'm saying. But for what and what should mm -hmm. be the outcome? So maybe there should be two mentors. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just mentoring is something I was looking into my um, in my research. And uh, so I feel we have to do a little bit of a closer look yeah. there. Mm -hmm. But just now I have to tell you the second part of my story. <laughs> <laughs> my, my oldest daughter, the one who studied tur tourism, she worked for Me Swiss Meteo, for Meteo Schweiz, for three years. And she has seen ah, a lot of projects, a lot of IT, a lot of, and, and she's so happy. It's, it's, it's quite interesting. And she's doing, she's just finishing now her a digital master. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there you go. So a job changer, huh? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> great. So I think maybe we have to wait a little bit. Mm -hmm. And when they start working, first profession, first, first experience, then we have mm -hmm. to catch them. <laughs> Never ever <Yeah>. give up. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm one of those examples. I I started tourism and then like I only changed to tech like six years ago. I was so like, make your daughters study tourism and then and, and then, then yeah. maybe that is the task for the future. <laughs> yeah, true. No, but but it's very important that you that you. I mean, super important. I I like live for for really bringing like those girls into the technical um already like studies and, and universities but very important also to show them and, and say them like you can do like other things and then later on maybe something will come up and you go mm -hmm. more into a technical um career so you don't have to decide because sometimes it's so much pressure and when you're like 18 19 and you think mm -hmm. yeah like, all these other possibilities and and i need to find the one thing no, I mean, it can come naturally later in life and, and then very important. Yeah, this clear and thing. Mm -hmm. So to so it was super important for me. I did like twice in my in my career to change completely <laughs> the sector and it worked out well. So mm -hmm. there are possibilities. Sometimes it's not so easy. Sometimes it's not the conventional way because you have to look for other things. It's not mm -hmm. always, as you said, sometimes it's like 10 years of experience. You have to need, uh, you have to have this master or whatever. Um, but there are possibilities, mm. maybe not the straight way, but there are other possibilities and ways Absolutely. to enter. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're already coming to the end of the discussion up here. Um, it's super interesting. Um, I do want to close quickly with a vote from all of you. Um, so we talked about what companies can do. We talked about what educators are doing and can do. Um, and so um, lastly, I'd like to um, get your vote on what every one of us can do, every individual um, regarding this topic, because I'm sure there's also a lot of people here in the room today that would just like uh, to know whether there's, what is kind of the most important thing that um, you think an individual can do to support young women um, to pursue a technical career? Maybe we can, we can start with you, Patricia. Yeah, sure. Quick quote. Um, I would stick with what I said before. I think we have to be open, listen to the girls, you know, what are their needs, what are their concerns, um, support them as, as mentors, um, can provide them with guidance so that they can build their resilience, self-confidence, and as you said, give them their time, you know, um, mm -hmm. because uh, when you come out of high school, there's a lot going on. I always refer to brain under construction, you know, so just one step at a time. Mm -hmm. And um, I really, really think that um, coming back to what I said before, we have to portray more women mm -hmm. in those roles. And that's why it's such an event is wonderful, but we have to do more of, because out there, there are so many wonderful women, you know, mm -hmm. um, that invented great things and nobody talks about them. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, maybe as a, as a, as a 
joint um, venture here, we could uh, think about that to portray them. Absolutely. Anna, what's your vote? Yeah, this is really a, a difficult question because you said all of us should uh, do something. I would say if we really go to the to the to the ground of it, at the end we have to change our society mm -hmm. um, because we see that that um, I think there are, there are a lot of, of research and reports why in Switzerland and in other European uh, countries there are less women in tech than Eastern Europe and India and and other countries and because it's uh, Maybe what to say, maybe because there's a freedom of choice uh, what to do. And uh, so I would say maybe it's uh, not enough pressure um, to choose maybe a more advanced uh, professional or whatever. And uh, but what I really would change is uh, in the society is the, uh, the gender segregation. Mm -hmm. um, because in Switzerland is one of the worst country that it's still in the DNA of, mm -hmm. of our society. Girls are going into a women profession and boys are going into a man profession. And we should get off. I think this is mm -hmm. really have to change that. Darcy. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, they've already said so much. I don't know what there is to add. <laughs> um, but as individuals, I would just say, I mean, reach out to, you know, nephews, nieces, uh, for, you know, daughters of friends of yours, you know, if you see someone, uh, a child who is interested, seems interested, is good at math, encourage them, you know, just kind of spread the word. I think as individuals, mm -hmm. that's what we can do. Of course, that said, it's not meant that every woman is going to go into tech, it should go into tech, or all men well, don't go all into men, tech, actually. right? You know, it's the <laughs> other way. We all have our natural abilities, and I think we should kind of just try to support and enhance and encourage, you know, what individuals have as their natural talents. And if that starts with tourism and comes back to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to technical, mm -hmm. that's great. If not, I mean, the world needs everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't try to convert everyone. But um, I think just in really encouraging any mm -hmm. young girls that you, or, or older ones, but you know, I try to, whenever I, I meet with the students, the female students, I say, you know, you, you, you can do this, you know, you can do a master's, you can do a PhD if you want, or you can start your own company, you know, this whole mentorship. Mm -hmm. trying to mentor the younger ones and tell them and show them the examples of, mm -hmm. of successful women in different places in society. I think that's really important. So providing these opportunities, I would say, is what as individuals we should continue trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it's like everything that you said, plus <laughs> um, I would say exposure. As I said before, exposure is extremely important uh, um, from a young age on um, for boys and girls, so very soft hand. And then afterwards, I have girls in the programs and boys in the program. They say, okay, I was there. It's nothing for me. Totally fine. I'm super happy about that because they tried. <laughs> and they say, okay, no, another pass. But exposure, if you have never seen it, how can you know? Mm -hmm. And then like the second thing is also in school, what we really try to do is like practical work, really. It's not like about theory, not like, first a year or like two year long, like um, all the concepts before you ever touch a computer or before mm -hmm. you ever like have something uh, in your hands <laughs> that is like a technical tool. Um, but really from day one on, we try to have like this practical work and and you can test things out. You can you can make mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, so so like create that safe space in schools already in the classroom where everyone can be there and can join and can test out and and sometimes it, it works out sometimes it, it um you mm. continue your pulse and sometimes not but at least you have tried and you've yeah. seen it all very nice Marina. so it's everyone say like <laughs> <laughs> so just to, to think about the exposure because um I kind of like to think like, uh, do you take your kids to skills park for sure? But do you also take them to the Umwelt Arena or you also take them to the Technorama? Or do you also buy a robot for a girl's birthday gift? I mean, mm -hmm. it's really like daily thing that you have to look into yourself because we are all inside mm -hmm. of this unconscious bias things really mm -hmm. quite, quite strongly. And um, the other thing is like about practical work. I totally love that one. <laughs> but, and I would say, if possible, in the form of project. Yeah. 
because if mm -hmm. kids can kind of bring their grain of uh, creation of saying uh, it, it's okay and sometimes people get a bit like yeah but the project is going to be then too easy not a complex enough it doesn't matter they need a sense of ownership in, mm -hmm. the, in the whole thing and that is much more than if the project was so complicated that the sense mm -hmm. of ownership i think it's mm -hmm. it's very important yeah Nice. Then afterwards, uh, I talked to Allah about <laughs> today because, <laughs> no, because I saw some nice numbers about what happens in, in poorer countries. Why are more women doing STEM? Mm -hmm. Let's see if this comes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and a good tradition, everything that was already <laughs> mentioned. And maybe just uh, slightly from organizational perspective and us being individuals within organization, I think it's very important to highlight the diversity of jobs in technology. So mm. it's not only about coding and being very strictly technical. It's about, it can be a project management in technology. It can be a business analyst within technology. So it's still within tech, but it's just, you, you still can find your niche within tech with the skills that you possess. So probably that's the message. And as mentioned before, it's really making uh, job offers uh, less strict or less kind of framed in a certain skill set, so more open for what needs to be done, what needs to be achieved. And as I mentioned, so I think this success or we will succeed when organizations have a groups, women in technology that are equally represented by men and women as well. So to show the interest and to highlight this importance. Very nice. Thank you so much for this nice round. All right, I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. So um, if there's any questions, please just uh, speak up. I think we also have some microphones, but I think we're close enough. Ah, OK, Alexandra is going to going to bring the microphone. So uh, it can be questions for the panelists. Uh, if there was something interesting you've heard or just something you're wondering about, you can also open it up generally and ask everyone um, whatever is on your mind. Um, if you speak up, please also quickly share who you are, maybe what your story is, why you're here um, so we can learn a bit um, about you. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> no, because we need it for the online audience. Uh, so hi, I'm Agnieszka and I actually do work in tech, um, in software de development as a product engineer. So I always like to say that I translate from like the nerdy code to human <laughs> and back so we can communicate better. Um, thank you very much for the discussion. It was very, very helpful also. And I... I can kind of relate to some things that you said that check my notes. What did I even note down? Um, so I was actually like I did follow in my education. Really, I went to all the math and physics classes and so on, but I was really encouraged by my parents. So this was like the only correct choice. I never even considered anything else. So this was easy from being a little girl. Um, but I know that I did want to study informatics at some point, and then I actually didn't because I was always thinking about IT. It's like, oh no, I don't want to be this person locked alone in the room, never talking to a human being, because I actually like humans. I actually like social interaction. I like the whole thing around also. That's also where my skills are. So maybe a question is like, how do you change this image of, tech being just those nerdy guys not seeing the sun and like being stuck in their rooms and not having social skills at all. Great question. Who would like to? <laughs> it's not really the full answer, but just a, a kind of a, a funny fact about it. So I, I told you guys we've been doing this trial and error story about getting the school teachers to us. So I would like to, to ask you back to guess what is uh, what is like the ma the biggest group of teachers that are coming to our courses. I have to say we tweak it a bit the descriptions, okay? So, <laughs> but you guys now have to try to guess because it's exactly about changing the image. <laughs> so let's see, what do you think? So in the Natec, the, the TTG, the, the uh, math, the physics, I mean, who is coming to our courses? Women. No, I want to like the top group. <laughs> Actually, we are getting the TTG, so the manual uh, works, and it's because of the way we describe it. So we really describe saying like, hey guys, this is the course about uh, 
really funny things into your projects because the most of this textile and uh, um, technical gestalt in order that mm -hmm. you have at school actually they have a lot of projects mm -hmm. and they they should be doing something with technic but there are lots of women most of them are these teachers are women and they were a bit wondering like oh i don't really feel like but we said you don't need to have any experience with coding just come and we're going to make funny projects and you can learn about it and you have the time and so I think it's about role models, it's about yeah. description and all of these things. How do we change the image? We got to start showing that this thing is much broader. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's also, if I may, like it's also coming back to the point of removing this mystery about IT and really explaining, and it's really a job for organization to explain what is included in this role and this job as IT. So it's, there is no more people left who are just sitting in front of the laptop because it's all so much customer face. So it's so, mu so much interaction with the customer is needed because if it's not, you're not successful. And that's why probably it should come even first before any technical skills. That's how kind of, you know, again, like, you know, it's the way you position it, that the way you market it in the end. Absolutely. Any more questions? Yeah. Okay. Ceci Wong uh, with Swiss Re. I also kind of I have a master in business administration. Administration. Then I worked in the supply chain for a while, and now I'm in IT since uh, ten years. And I must say, um, I work mainly with women who are so much faster than the other men of the group, I have to admit it. <laughs> but we have a, a manager who's also really nurturing the talent in the team, and that also makes the difference. And this is where we're talking about educating men. I think that's that's super important. I totally relate to that. Now, I also have children who arrived at, uh, in Switzerland, so one boy, one girl. Girl playing football, but not so interested in texts right now, I must say. <laughs> but, uh, um, I've got a question because I've seen the development as well through the education system here, and um, I could see that when they were in a primary school, they were so these kind of fairs where they could see what kind of apprenticeship they could do, but that was very, very local. And now that they are in the in the cantonal schooler, so give me high mess, I could see that, you know, for the high mess, they had to look for a practicum and they were this uh, messa, this fair, mm -hmm. where the companies had to introduce themselves and I thought, okay, this is really the trigger for them. You know, it's, I mean, kids, not just about the, the subject, that's also the whole appearance at this age, they're very influenceable. And I was wondering whether that's for the apprenticeship, whether that's for the further studies, whether there were such affairs for the kids where they can really speak to people because this personal connection they're going to make to your universities, to your, you know, to, to also the companies, is also super important. I mean, they come back home and they tell you, oh, you know, actually, I like to apply for this company because the person I met is, is really nice. So if we were also getting the women and the tech women in our companies or, or in the studies, so to be there in this event to say, hey, you know, this is the cool things that we do with pictures about, you know, how the campus is looking like and how the company is looking like, because when they come back, this is this is the first feedback they're giving us. So um, I don't know, maybe that's already existing for the mm -hmm. apprenticeship. Again, I haven't, I've seen it very local. Not skills, really. for instance. Okay. So, so something which is really, you know, where all the gimmick classes have to go to this fair because yeah, that's part of... to go, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, for high mess, that's what they had to do for the practicum, right? Where the companies had to, to introduce themselves. So I thought that's something which really is a, is a very nice entry point. And when this kind of institutionalized then that's that's easy and if i may just another thing in terms of attracting women at the workplace it's also work flexibility in terms of so at swiss Re, we've got this own the way you work like if my children are sick then i can i can stay at home we know that switzerland is super traditional super patriarchal i mean we see that every day right so it's not that the woman has to be the first caregiver but at least if she has to, she has the flexibility and the employer understands that. Or work part time. It's not just, you know, being able to work from wherever you, you have to work, but also have this flexibility to say I'm working 80%, I'm working 60%. I think that's also a very, very important point. Yeah. Great question. Maybe we can start with the with the fairs. I know also ETH has these fairs. Where um, I've actually, as a as an alumni, I went to these these fairs at my uh, high school, um, and uh, I'll maybe yeah, there are some kind of uh, Berufsmessen mm -hmm. for for the apprentices. Yeah, mm -hmm. 
But I think especially when, when it comes to companies, what we're also seeing at Girls in Tech often is that companies more and more start thinking about their employer branding, right? How do they want to position themselves? How do they want to be seen? Um, and the, 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 the gender is definitely a topic that we've seen in the last two, three years has increased a lot. I'm, I'm sure at advance you probably see that as well. Um, but still, there needs to be an, an awareness, right? How you communicate jobs. We recently worked with a company and they sent us a job um, and I looked at it and I was like, the, so you want to advertise this for women, but the first picture on the job is like a man explaining something to three women sitting there. It's like, <laughs> you're looking for a head of something and you want to put a picture on there with a guy who's explaining something. To, and, and this is like, this sends a message to anyone who looks at this job description, right? And I think there it's really about uh, learning from each other and, and just sharing. It's usually, uh, I see this also in my own company. Whenever I see something where I'm like, mm, this is a bit odd, I just call it out and often they're like oh th thank you so much like I wasn't aware um, mm -hmm. and and so it's really to just co communicate about this and, and share and exchange and I think um, yeah th that would be my take on on, on this yeah yeah and it's uh, super important to as you say to see the women so when when we do promotion I only send my female coaches and female students to the schools that's really like, um, and it's also good for the boys because they see <laughs> that, okay, these are the female, like the female future um, of, of technical professions. Okay, cool. And, and they come anyways because they love to develop games and whatever. So <laughs> you attract them anyways. And the girls, they see, oh, okay. And many of the girls tell me later, I came explicitly because I saw the female coaches. And I said, oh, okay, I'm not alone there. So, okay, I can go. It will be fun. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, I, I work for a fintech company and my question is more about recruiting. How do you encourage, I mean, we, we advertise and out of 400 applications, we get maybe three women. Um, we've gone through wording, trying to change the wording, trying to get more, but we only get like three goals out of 400 applicants. How would you suggest that a fintech company? What more can we do to bring to encourage women? Our last our last female recruiter came in only because I met her because she thought the company was only men, and then we met her with another woman and she joined us. But I, we don't know what more to do if you get if you if you get 400 applications and only three come back of women. What would you suggest? Maybe I can start as well to share similar statistics. So usually for tech roles, it's like out of 10 applications, only one woman, right? And again, as I mentioned before, so we worked, uh, we're working quite closely with our talent uh, acquisitors about wording and about adding some flexibility, some in some cases, 80% and 60 to hundred percent to provide these options as well. But actually, again, like, you know, of course, it's not universal, but what really works of uh, it's a proactive, uh, it's active recruiting when the girls, the women are uh, actively um, kind of approached during the first, during the events, during on LinkedIn and ask, oh, have you seen this opportunity? Maybe you try. And usually the first reaction is like, oh, no, it's kind of it's kind of similar, but like, no, my skills like not matching. And then it's more like, you know, engaging in this discussion and like encouraging. And then like it results in something but of course it's there is no universal kind of you know, recipe for it but it's really be there and kind of this physical one-to-one -one, like a proactive approaching really works best, better than any wording and trying so there is no magic calculation of how a position works unless we haven't discovered yet maybe maybe there is something some AI tool. Yeah. maybe we can add to that and it's not something that you as a company can do but it goes back to what what you said in terms of society and culture you know i feel that in this country there's still this bias and and quite unconsciously towards those kinds of, of uh, companies you know so if if the company gets perceived as kind of male dominated or in a male area well, you can do whatever you want, right? I mean, um, it's not up to the co company then. So I think it, we have to start much earlier and then we have to kind of really um, tweak a little bit how we think about um, certain roles in this in this culture. Um, and I'm pretty sure, you know, if you go to a different culture, for instance, in India, um, there the majority of coders are women. And it's just 
that that's the normal, right? That's the norm. And so it goes back to what do we think is is normal and what is different, right? And um, so maybe there should also be a more of a joint approach. Exactly. Or you sh you should be really do it completely different again. Mm -hmm. So um, we did one experience in one one of the association. I'm in the board. We were lo looking for a new CEO, and in the first round, round there was I would say 10% women, and at the end there were two guys, two men, and not at all convincing. So we decided no one of these two, and we we decided to do a second ad, <clears throat> and the headline of the second ad was, "We are looking for a female CEO. It could also be a man." <laughs> <laughs> and a completely different text um, and now we have a female CEO. <laughs> yes, maybe one more last question. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for this uh, amazing panel and all the inputs. I just had to uh, add a personal story. My name is Maya. I work with in IT like 22 years already. And actually I come from Serbia, so I can confirm that in Eastern Europe there are so many more women. And actually we don't even have this kind of discussion, honestly, especially today. Uh, on the other story, I also have two girls, both in Gimi at the moment. And the older one chose to do Altsprachen, not even Neusprachen. So it was a disaster. I mean, I was like, for, for me and my husband. Uh, Altsprachen, like old languages. And you know why? This is because her role model is her Latin teacher, who is 25 year old, young, fantastic lady. And this is what I just wanted to ask, actually. Did you maybe notice that? Most of the teachers in schools, as we just said, right, are women. And also in the topics like uh, languages or textile and gestalten, but for math, for physics, for chemi, you have male teachers who not only that they're male and then 15 year old child wouldn't kind of resemble to, but they are actually, their style of teaching is super dry. And then again, there, there is this Latin teacher who is like very, you know, fluffy and then like very cheerful. And then you decide to do old languages. But yeah, we will see what happens. <laughs> um, I'm actually, have a, I have a colleague. I also work in tech. I actually work with Agnieszka. And I have a colleague who also did old languages. He's working now in software development. So don't worry, <laughs> it might still work out. Um, old languages are not that bad. Not that uh, <laughs> but yeah, maybe um, I think on the role models of teachers, I think that's an extremely important topic um, that is like. <laughs> it's a mess. I would say it's a mess because in at the primary school, there are only women and women sh should teach math mm -hmm. and they don't like math, so mm -hmm. they should mm -hmm. teach math. And, and then it's exactly what you said. So uh, as well, on the the teachers should be the gender gap, but the teacher side should also yeah. be mm -hmm. yeah. close. Yeah. yeah, it's a little bit of a hen and the egg question. Yeah, exactly. You know, where do you start? <laughs> I mean, uh, probably both directions. Absolutely. And then there are even other multipliers after school and all these female role models come all the girly magazines. The girly magazines <laughs> they start reading at 12 to 15. What's in there, right? <laughs> so. There is this great initiative called Equal Voice from the Ringier Group. They measure, actually the goal is to have women and men equally represented, not only in terms of uh, visibility, but also in terms of how they're framed. So women we often see in certain roles, <laughs> men in leadership roles. And yeah, I don't know if they cover the girly magazines as well, but what is role modeled in there? I don't think it's you just have to go with your kids into the front school web and the girls know where to yeah. go and the boys where know where to go. So, so we have a root there. Yeah, we have a root problem throughout culture, right? From bottom <laughs> to the top. So we have a lot of work to do. Exactly. Thank you all so much for sharing and also for the great questions. Uh, I, I hope this was uh, uh, insightful for all and we're going to 
of course continue the conversation also at the opera but i'd like to um say a big big thank you to all of the panelists it was amazing to have you all here and i'm also hoping that maybe this in, in event today sparks a little more exchange between educators companies and because that's also something that i'm often seeing is that there's eth doing something there's some Kalan doing something there's like other schools doing doing things um and we could also kind of put all the power together and do something that scales a little bit more and so um just as a as a little input maybe for you guys but thank you so much and uh, also thank you to the audience for joining today's panel discussion yeah big applause for this great panel for this wonderful moderation <laughs> Actually, I'm a, a bit blown over. This was amazing. It was uh, one of the most amazing events uh, on the tech topic <laughs> that I've ever had with Advance. So thank you so much. Before we're going uh, to the apero, which to which we are kindly invited by Six, who is yeah uh, sponsoring this great apero. Please all stay as long as you can. Um, I'd like to announce that there is more of Connected Advance. So we have two great events coming up. One is uh, for all uh, women who think they're board ready. So there is this uh, boardroom uh, cooperation uh, on this. You find it all on the website, by the way. And there is another event which goes a little bit in what you were saying, right? We need to really change a lot. So how can we uh, leverage structural changes in this country to really create a future which is Geschlechtergerecht, uh, sagen wir auf Deutsch. This event will, by the way, be in German because it's a little bit political. We're going into the political arena here. Please join us if you can on the 20th of June. You find everything on our website. Um, and on the same topic, if I click the slides, I'm in charge here. Um, we also do, so watch out for this, we also do a little bit of a campaign where we want <laughs> where we want to help this initiative for individual taxation to really get enough signatures to uh, to get uh, to be voted on why it's it's in switzerland the, t the taxation system is such as it sort of prevents women to go back to work when they start a family why because incomes are um, summed up the husband's and the wife's income are summed up uh, and then they get into progression and have to pay more taxes comes higher child care, whatever, however expensive child care on top. And then the discussion among husband and wife is, oh, well, it's not really, you know, we don't have in, uh, m m more money at the end of the month if you go back to work because we pay more taxes and we have to pay for child care. So why don't you just stay at home, have a great time, you know, as a mummy, and then five, six, seven years later, nah, no, then you find out it wasn't a good decision. So really, we need this splitting of the, anyway, you're taxated as an individual. This helps gender equality. So watch out for this campaign. If you want to join, please do so. All of you on the panel would be great if you're there. We uh, invite you all to join us. And if you see it in social media, please like, engage and share. Okay, great. Last but not least, there's something else coming. Oh, yes. If you want to stay connected, we are in social media. We are. Um, we have a newsletter where you get, um, you know, from time to time, an update on what's coming. So, if you're interested, please uh, sign up. And now, yeah, <laughs> thank you once again. We hope to see you soon again. And uh, the apparel, I think, is now open for everybody. Um, so, please join us. Uh, love to connect and chat there. <laughs>